Okay, here we are, back in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. We've come now to verse number 42. Here's another commandment of Jesus Christ. It's within the context of how we relate to our enemies and how we are supposed to be loving people like God loves them. And Jesus tells his followers, Matthew 5, 42, give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. And, you know, again, you, you could never build your entire theology of giving on that one verse, now could you? Jesus was not trying to give an all-encompassing, all-inclusive theology of giving with one sentence. What's he, what's he trying to do? He's just trying to encourage people, don't be stingy with your money, don't be selfish, be unselfish, and don't just think of yourself, think of other people. But does this mean that everyone who asks us for money, the, 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 the alcoholic on the street corner who says, I'm asking for $10 in obedience to Christ, you give that man $10? Are you really helping that person? No. Now, you could still give that person something. Maybe you could say, look, I'm not going to give you 10 bucks, but right down here is a fast food place, and uh, I'll buy you lunch. That way I can be sure this is going to go to food, and I'm going to have lunch with you. As a matter of fact, because I got my lunch hour right now, and I got some things I want to tell you about what God has done in my life. Well, ne there you go. There, there you go. What about the, what about the, the leech, the person who is irresponsible, who makes lots of poor financial decisions and has, you know, uh, wasted their money and so forth, and they're coming to ask you for a loan, or the, per the lazy person who's unwilling to work. Well, there's other verses that come to bear on our understanding of our responsibility as far as stewardship. The Bible says, if any man will not work, what? Neither let him eat. And we're not called to support lazy people. No, uh, we need to let them go hungry for a bit until their stomach uh, connects with their brain. And then they'll be motivated to get busy. I, I, I heard a story one time years ago about a pastor. I think it was during the Depression. And uh, he frequently had men coming to his church office and asking for a handout. And he would say, well, have you looked for a job? Oh, yeah, I've looked for a job. I haven't been able to find anything. Well, would you be willing to work if you, someone offered you a job? Well, of course I would be. You know, well, great, great. Uh, out behind the church, there's a, you know, a big pile of, 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 of logs. Uh, there's an ax lying there. You go back there, and if you'll, uh, you know, just have at it. Start splitting those logs and put in a couple of hours here, and I'll come out when you're, when, you're, when you're tired, and I'll see how much you've done, and I'll give you a fair wage for your work. And they'd all, he said they'd always thank him and walk out the door as if <laughs> they're going to hit that wood pile. And he said, I never see him again because they didn't want to work. They wanted a handout. So giving pers a person an opportunity to earn some money is a great way to give and a way to weed out those who, to whom we should not give, okay? Uh, but, but again, you understand, uh, when people try to take one sentence of what Christ commanded and build their entire theological understanding around that one sentence without any balancing of other verses, they're liable to get off track, and people have done that, okay? So we're supposed to be uh, borrow, uh, lenders, you know? And, and again, how are you gonna lend unless you have something to lend? How are you gonna give unless you have something to give? You see, so uh, that, that's indication that God doesn't want us destitute in utter poverty because then we have no opportunity to give or to lend. Enough said. Well, then we come to verse five and verse, uh, chapter five, verse number 43. And here's the sixth time that Jesus says, you have heard that it was said. And by now, you know what to look for, don't you? You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor. Well, that's the second greatest commandment. But then there's a second part tacked on there that wasn't to be found anywhere in the Old Testament, and hate your enemy. And so can you see, it's so crystal clear. Come on, stand up and applaud. What you're hearing the truth here right now, because there's no doubt about it. I've been telling you the truth, and that is Jesus was not correcting his own Old Testament words. He's correcting the twisting of his Old Testament words of the, by the scribes and Pharisees. You shall love your neighbor 
and hate your enemy. He's gonna say, oh, I'm gonna correct that one. No, sir, no, sir, that's not what I want. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and unrighteous. So can you see what, what Christ is emphasizing here? He's saying, I'm not giving you anything new. This is, this is no new, different revelation. This is not something like I'm, I'm, I'm saying the old covenant law was wrong and now I've come to dramatically, radically turn it around and turn it upside down. No, no, no. God has been teaching you this ever since God has been God and people have been people. God is one who is obviously loving his enemies and he's kind to those who hate him. He, he, how do you know? Because he causes his son to rise on everybody equally. And he sends his reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. See, so Jesus is fulfilling the law, not abolishing the law and the prophets, as he said, but fulfilling it, filling it to the full, just bringing people back to the original intent and what was lacking in their understanding. He's filling up their understanding. Ah, oh, yes, Jesus, I'm starting to see it. You know, why didn't we see this ourselves? Why have we let the scribes and Pharisees been misle mislead us all this time? My goodness, look at the example God has been setting for us, how he's been teaching us by his own example. We need to follow that good example of God. Love enemies, be kind to him. Now, notice nowhere did Jesus ever say, you know, like, above when he said, if someone slaps you on the cheek, you know, turn them the other cheek. He never said, if your enemy is nearby you, give him a knife so that, you know, and lay down and say, and put, it, and put a big target right on your heart so he can kill you. No, no. You see, he's talking about just getting along, uh, being, an, you know, a loving person who's extraordinarily loving. But there is a limit. Justice comes into play, and we'll talk about that a little bit more next time. And I'll see you next time.